I'm Harriet Vance Ball, Associate Professor of Medicine and Cardiologist for McMaster University in Canada, and I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Professor Peter Ponikowski, Professor of Cardiology, Acting Rector and Vice Rector for Scientific Affairs and Head of the Department of Heart Diseases at Wroclaw Medical University, Poland. Welcome, Dr. Ponikowski. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Great pleasure and honor to be here with you. We are here to discuss the findings of the atrial fibrillation substudy in the Victoria trial, a trial that tested the efficacy of Verisiguat in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Dr. Ponikowski, would you start us off by telling us about the rationale for this substudy? Well, perhaps, thank you very much for this question. Perhaps uh, I give you a little bit background of the whole concept. Uh, in this atrial fibrillation is uh, the most frequent uh, arrhythmia complicated, complicating heart failure in general, in particular heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And we still, to be honest with you, do not know whether atrial fibrillation is an independent predictor of poor outcome or rather a reflection of the underlying heart failure severity. Uh, there are two important issues I would like uh, to stress uh, that heart failure, some heart failure treatments uh, may well reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation in patients with HFREF. And also some treatments, uh, the effects of some guideline recommended therapies may well differ according atrial fibrillation is present or absent in HFREF patients. Uh, I think that uh, in Victoria trial, in which we, in which we randomized more than 5,000 patients with worsening heart failure, half ref patients at a very high risk. So they were either in hospital or just discharged from the hospital over the last six months. But also we included patients who had worsening heart failure event uh, on an ambulatory basis. And this sick people in this high risk population nearly 50% tended to report history of atrial fibrillation. And uh, we, that was the background. So we really wanted to, to see, to determine the relationship between uh, the clinical outcomes uh, in Victoria trial and the presence of atrial fibrillation at baseline. But also we were quite interested uh, about occurrence of new onset of atrial fibrillation post-randomization. Uh, in general, it was uh, the, the, the aim of the objective, uh, the, the, they were the objectives of our analysis. So a uh, really very high risk population with a lot of uh, those with history of uh, atrial fib and uncertainty, what about the effect of very cigarette? Uh, just to remind uh, uh, the audience that in Victoria, we demonstrated that, that very cigarette uh, in this population reduces the risk of primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. So in, in brief, it was the objective of our analysis. How was the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation confirmed? Uh, and were these patients with persistent atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? Well, this very good question, uh, the data at the randomization visit were, uh, based on the analysis of the medical history available from CRFs. However, we also carefully evaluated uh, the investigator reports on whether or not atrial fibrillation is present. And to directly answer your question on this kind of a classification, we used a little bit different approach to classification of atrial fibrillation. Based on this material, on this data we had, we decided to classify patients on, of, with atrial fibrillation or classify uh, atrial fibrillation in general in two categories, three categories. One was not known atrial fibrillation. Second, we called it history of atrial fibrillation alone or intermittent AF. So without atrial fibrillation on ECG, but with a history from the, from the case report forms. And finally, a third group was with atrial fibrillation confirmed being present on randomization ECG. And just for your perusal and the audience perusal, we also classified post-randomization onset of atrial fibrillation 
in the in those with not known AF or those with intermittent AF, in other words, with history, but not ECG being present at randomization. So in general, this kind of approach. Right. So why don't you tell us about the um, subgroup analysis? Thank you very much. Uh, with pleasure. Uh, out of 5,050 patients, we had complete data on AF status at baseline in 5010. So in brief, uh, atrial fibrillation status at baseline can be characterized as I uh, as, uh, as follows. 53% uh, had not known atrial fib. So as I said, nearly 50% either had intermittent atrial fibrillation or atrial fibrillation on randomization ECG. In fact, intermittent AF was present in 20% and 27% had AF on randomization ECG. So as I mentioned, only 50% of patients tended to have a atrial fibrillation. Uh, there were differences in the clinical characteristics. In brief, patients with either type of uh, atrial fibrillation, they were uh, older, they were more often male, they were more often in NEHA class three and four and randomization, they typically tended to have a obviously higher anti-pro BNP, it was the inclusion criteria. Uh, they tended to have a higher magic score. So in other words, the, the higher risk of complications of a poorer outcome. Uh, also uh, regarding therapy, anti-thrombotic therapy was obviously used most, more frequently in, this, in all patients with, uh, with um, uh, atrial fibrillation. I'm sure that you want also and me to tell you about the association between atrial FIB status at randomization and the study outcomes in general. So I can only say that uh, only cardiovascular death, the risk of cardiovascular death uh, was um, ele elevated, I would say higher after uh, adjudication in patients with the history of atrial fibrillation alone. All other events, considering the primary composite outcome, so cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization or heart failure hospitalization, did not much, um, did not differ very much um, uh, across the, the population. So, in other words, um, atrial um, fibrillation status and randomization, uh, and randomization did not actually make uh, any effect uh, and in relationship in the context of uh, primary and secondary outcomes. And perhaps uh, the association of Beresiguat uh, with atrial FIP um, uh, status at baseline is important. I can only say that uh, uh, Beresiguat was beneficial regardless of which atrial fibrillation group with or without uh, at baseline um, uh, we studied with uh, P4 interaction in all these uh, groups, uh, not statistically significant. So uh, also in the context of primary outcome and all components of primary outcome, so cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, the, um, the positive effects of very cigarette was were seen across the, the, uh, the, the whole population, regardless uh, of the AF status at baseline. And finally, I think quite uh, intriguing result uh, and uh, I must say that only, only during, during only 10, actually the median follow-up was 10.11 months, an episode of post-randomization AF occurred in around 10% of patients, much more often in patients who uh, did have intermittent AF, so history of AF without AF at baseline ECG. And, uh, I think there was no difference um, uh, in the post-randomization um, new onset AF um, between patients receiving uh, placebo or receiving Beresiguat. But what really matters uh, is that post-randomization atrial FIB in this high-risk population, um, uh, new onset of post-randomization uh, AF um, in this population was uh, related to uh, nearly double uh, twofold risk of uh, primary and secondary end, uh, endpoint. So primary endpoint, the risk of primary endpoint in these patients who tended to have post-randomization or uh, 
uh, onset of AF uh, in both groups, placebo and varicigo, was twice as high as in those who didn't have um, uh, post-randomization or onset of a AF. The same happened uh, if we, the same we saw, if we consider separately cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. So this would be a very, very brief uh, overview of the, of the results. Sure. And of course, uh, we have to interpret subgroup analyses with um, some caution. What was the mechanism that drove this sub-analysis? So what mechanism of action of Risiguat might one have uh, relied on to expect a difference? Or did you not expect a difference in treatment effect? Point very well taken. Uh, and I tell you that Varisiguet is actually a drug which uh, targets completely novel. That's very good that you are asking this question because what we are typically doing for HEVREF patients, we consider uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system to be a target for intervention, mm -hmm. or we go for overactive sympathetic nervous system. Some people may say that beta blockers are different. So we don't know how they work, but still though. So make it this neuroendocrine activation. Here, we targeted uh, uh, cyclic uh, GMP signaling. Uh, and we know very well that cyclic GMP signaling is impaired and there is cyclic GMP uh, deficiency, which translates into myocardial and vascular dysfunction. Uh, whether we expected much difference, uh, I must say, I am not certain we were trying to uh, we are trying we were trying to investigate whether and how this potential relationship between uh, the risk of first of all what we wanted to say whether in this very high risk population this uh, often quoted relationship between af and poor outcome uh, after adjustment for all these covariates still holds true and we found virtually nothing. Then we also didn't find any relationship between, um, uh, between uh, uh, Verisiguat and, uh, and uh, presence or absence of AF at baseline. I must tell you that the analysis was driven maybe not the basic mechanism, but uh, some observation from the, from the um, earlier studies, uh, analysis, that Verisiguat may not work uh, as efficiently in patients above a certain level of anti-proBNP. As a level of anti-proBNP higher was, uh, the, uh, was the inclusion criteria for, for, uh, atrial, for patients with atrial fibrillation, there may be some sort of a potential, potential concern whether this patient would benefit uh, the same way. We didn't say, we didn't see any any differences. Uh, there were some uh, potential uh, discussions, and we, we, we published this in European Journal of Heart Failure, uh, where we briefly tried to link potentially higher risk of cardiovascular death with the presence of atrial fibrillation. But to be honest with, with you and with, with all the audience, this is highly speculative. And I think that the bottom line here is that uh, not such relationship overall uh, were convincingly dom documented, demonstrated in this, in this population. Right, and certainly the, um, the variation in risk reduction and perhaps the um, heightened risk we see with verisiguat among those with the highest anti-proBNP levels has received uh, great coverage. Uh, it may be a play of chance, um, but it may also be a legitimate finding that deserves further exploration, in which case I would ask you, what do you hypothesize is the mechanism behind that finding, that patients at the highest NT pro BNP level, who presumably um, are faced with the highest risk, and therefore, statistically speaking, are well suited to showing risk reduction with effective therapies. Why do you think they did not? I can only tell you that uh, I partially may agree with you that uh, it may well be a chance finding. But on the other hand, uh, we 
analyze this carefully and we address this issue carefully and there is even a paper quite recently published where we have this 8,000 as a, uh, I would say cut level above which the effects uh, are not seen if not some sort of deterioration. Maybe biologically, maybe biologically, this is a stage above which uh, we can't really expect. Uh, I fully agree with you that this is very high, very high risk population. And maybe above, above which uh, you can't really uh, expect any additional benefit by targeting this mechanism. However, you can challenge me by asking that actually Omecamtiv mecarbil did completely opposite, worked very well in those above a certain level of anti-proBNP and below a certain level of LV ejection fraction. So maybe this is not that end for those at very late and advanced stage. Point very well taken. I think the, uh, the matter for the future analysis may be different mechanisms, maybe different uh, drugs uh, targeting different mechanisms at different, uh, uh, at different levels or at, at different uh, uh, time points of the natural history of patients with heart failure. Still, sorry to say, pretty speculative, but that would be my, my explanation. Right, and perhaps looking at the co-interventions in that high-risk group, perhaps patients became intolerant of other medical therapies and it deserves further exploration. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to us today. It was my pleasure to meet you and discuss this fascinating trial and the sub-study with you. And I hope we have a chance to connect again. I would love to. I would love to. So, so many uh, important issues, including the study with, uh, with iron uh, deficiency, with pericalboximaltose, yes. with the new guidelines. So I am I'm always looking forward. So thank you very much for your kind invitation. My pleasure. Bye-bye.